Good morning. Welcome to the Westminster Social Justice Forum. I am Reverend Elena Simone Tyler, Associate Pastor for Justice and Mission here at Westminster. This morning, we are welcoming Nirja Singh and Christy Grom, both from the Department of Human Services. We will um, get to hear a discussion between Nirja and Christy about the work, the very timely work they have been doing this past year and really all of their careers around substance use disorders. Both of them will describe efforts that are underway here in the state of Minnesota to provide high quality, effective, individualized care to all Minnesotans. And um, as we listen, let's um, think about how we as a people of faith, as a congregation, what role it is that we can play. How is it that we can help with um, addressing the stigma, the stigma associated with addiction and also how can we be a community that is open and supportive of those who are in recovery. So thank you for joining us today and thank you to Christy and Nirja and to Ken Jocelyn and Phil Asgian for their, their role in helping this come together and Michelle Lavelle Henry, thank you all. Good morning. My name is Ken Jocelyn, and I'm a member of the Westminster Social Justice Ministry team. Uh, we build our social justice forums around a common theme for the program year. Our theme this year is diving deeper together so all may flourish. The theme builds on our heightened awareness of the systemic and critical issues affecting our community brought together brought to further atten uh, attention by the recent most serious response to the murder of George Floyd. Uh, though the for through the forums, we learn about longstanding needs and become more prepared to support the flourishing of all members of our community. Today, we welcome two representatives from the Department of Health Services of the state of Minnesota, who will be addressing the integrated approach to the opioid use disaster and the opioid use disorder treatment for Minnesotans. We are pleased to welcome Nirja Singh, who is the Clinical Behavioral Health Director, and Christy Gram, who is the Legislative Director. Our speakers will discuss the social and historical context related to substance use uh, treatment in Minnesota, focusing on efforts of the state of Minnesota that is making to provide high quality, effective individualized care for Minnesotans. This discussion is being pre-recorded in advance, so there it, um, and it may include other members of the social justice team to address questions and comments. Please note that social justice forums will be paused during the Christmas holidays and will resume January 9th. So I now want to turn this over to Nirja Singh and Christy Gam. Good morning. Thank you, Ken. My name is Nirja Singh, and I am the Clinical Behavioral Health Director for Department of Human Services um, in the state of Minnesota. And in my role, I am uh, responsible uh, to make sure there is integrated care available uh, to all Minnesotans, um, and I primarily focus on mental health and substance use uh, disorder care. Um, and now I will ask my colleague, uh, Christy Graham, to introduce herself. Thanks, Nirja, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Christy Grom, and I am the Legislative Director for the Community Supports Administration at the Department of Human Services. And community supports is the same area that Nirja works over, um, but it covers a whole span of, of divisions and policy areas. Um, so we work with disability services, HIV AIDS, um, behavioral health, which includes mental health and um, SUD, substance use disorders, um, as well as housing and deaf and hard of hearing services. And um, as the legislative director of the administration, really my main priority is to um, um, put together the governor's budget and, and policy recommendations um, and sort of monitor bills that are being moved throughout um, the legislative session and help to make them um, you know, implementable and also in line with our policy direction um, and the, the administration's policy direction. 
So I don't know, Nirja, if you want to um, kick it off. Yes, I will. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking the Social Justice Forum uh, to invite us uh, to talk about this uh, epidemic of opioid crisis that is impacting the whole country. Um, and we are seeing the impact in Minnesota. So prior to um, us like getting into opioid crisis, uh, I would just like to kind of mention a little bit about how state of Minnesota is uh, perceiving addiction as. So all the work that state of Minnesota is doing in the world of substance use disorder, we treat addiction as a treatable chronic medical condition. And I really want um, our listeners to focus on medical condition. It's a disease that involves complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, environment, and life experiences. In no way or form, we are going to be treating addiction as either a moral failure or a personal choice. Very much like a physical health condition or a mental health condition, addiction does respond to treatment approaches as well as prevention efforts. Uh, so by saying that, um, I am just gonna be kind of talking about our current state of crisis um, in Minnesota. The opioid related overdose deaths in the state are uh, alarmingly high. And as we all know, like pandemic has um, really led to increased um, loneliness, isolation, and um, tons of like other concerns which lead to uh, people like using substances to cope with uh, their uh, their issues. So in Minnesota, based on the DHS uh, warehouse data, we starting from 2020 to 2021, we had total 960 deaths um, due to overdose. Uh, and these are like the, I want to kind of make sure that these are the uh, numbers which are based on the data that DHS has. Um, it really does not have like all sources included. So there is a chance that num this number might be high. So, and also like every day, our uh, people of Minnesota are showing up in the ERs, uh, struggling with various implications of addiction. Uh, and they are really, they're, there is like a lot of cry for help. So, and I just want to kind of make sure that people are, our listeners are clear that it's not like the gloomy, uh, disappointing and hopeless situation. We, Christy and I will be talking about some of the efforts we have made. Um, but I just wanted to start with this like kind of information and also uh, remind people uh, when we are uh, looking at our neighbors, our families, our relatives, uh, just be mindful of the fact that loneliness has really, loneliness that has been produced by pandemic. And also as Ken mentioned, uh, the really glaring racism experiences with George Floyd's murder uh, have really led to people resorting to chemicals. Uh, so it's, it's very important that we are there for each other. It's very important that we encourage each other to seek help um, and deal with, continue dealing with the stigma associated with addiction. Um, Christy and I, um, we share like a uh, passion for this work because both of us were associated uh, with this field way before we even uh, came to DHS. So I want to ask Christy to share with us uh, what she has observed in the community around rise of addiction and mental health concerns. Uh, and then also like Christy, if you can just I have our viewers, I have our listeners, <laughs> um, just get your perspective on how you are bringing the stakeholders perspective when do, you are doing your work with the legislators. Um, so I'm going to yeah. invite Christy. Thanks, Nirja. So yeah, like Nirja mentioned, um, Nirja and I used to work together at a, a transitional housing program that's no longer in operation, but it was a um, really wonderful program that served American Indian women who were in recovery um, from substance use disorders and opiate use disorders. Um, and so I had really spent about eight years working in that setting. Um, I had always wanted to kind of be where I'm at right now, working on public policy and really trying to make changes to the system. But before I did that, I thought it was really important to um, actually 
experience um, what things are like on the ground and what people are really experiencing um, so that that could inform my approach as a as a um, public policy person. Um, I would say there's just what, what I witnessed in my time working with American Indian women, many of them were suffering from opiate use disorders. Um, there's just a lot of shame and a lot of stigma around that altogether. And I think that really prevented women from um, seeking treatment earlier um, and getting getting that treatment so that they didn't end up in, in precarious situations. So oftentimes what would happen is um, because of the shame and because of the immense trauma that many of these communities were facing, um, you know, they would get um, addicted to substances and just not want to admit it. Um, and then oftentimes it would lead to things like um, a child being removed, which is a terrible, terrible experience for anyone. Um, and obviously even further stigmatizing. So oftentimes we worked with women who came to us after a child had been removed. Um, I think in Minnesota right now, I think as of 2020, about one third of all removals from the home of, of children ending up in the child protection system are from substance use disorder, related to substance use disorder. So that's a huge, a huge amount of children that we're seeing also being impacted um, by the epidemic. Um, and, and many of those children, I think the, the vast majority, especially in Minnesota, are disproportionately um, by, BIPOC communities, so Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, I think there's also just a lot of um, a lot of stigma, not just for the the person you know wanting to access treatment or feeling like they were ready to access treatment or willing to admit that they had an issue, um, but also stigma that's imposed by the society around. Um, you know, where we're, where we're, where people are um, interacting. So for example, housing. So working to try to find landlords who would accept someone or even finding housing programs oftentimes. Um, many of the, the people that I worked with um, would come to our program because other programs wouldn't accept them because they were using methadone or suboxone, which are, um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about, but medication assisted treatment options for people with opiate use disorders that are evidence-based um, and, and medically, um, you know, medically necessary to treat that health condition. Um, but many even um, treatment providers or housing providers would not even allow that person to live in their program while they were using um, that medication. Um, and so really kind of coming at it from the abstinence-based approach. Um, Trying to think if there's anything else. I, I mean, I would just say that um, in terms of like stigma and what I've seen in the community is just there's so much, especially in the American Indian community, but I mean, as well as in the African American community, there's so much um, intergenerational trauma. And I just can't emphasize that enough and how that impacts um, people's, um, you know, susceptibility to addiction. Um, and then getting services and just it's just a huge problem in the community that we have to really collectively face and look for solutions. Thank you, Christy. Um, and I'm going to come back to you just kind of in, in one minute because I really want to touch the whole seeking stakeholder engagement when you do your legislative work. Um, I just want to kind of emphasize how this stigma associated with addiction is impacting uh, our BIPOC communities and our American Indian communities. Uh, there is a disproportionately high uh, number of overdose deaths for our community in our communities of color. Um, and we are still like kind of, well, the reasons are no brainer for ever, anyone, but still like kind of we are going to analyze the possible reasons why our BIPOC communities and our American Indian communities are scared of seeking treatment? Are, why are they not feeling supported that, you know what, it's not going to be seen as a moral failure and I will not be uh, put in jail for admitting or even like saying I have an issue because we all are aware how uh, our criminal justice system and how addiction was perceived there, it's changing and there are so many reforms happening. Uh, but but it's still like, it's very much alive in our uh, social, social fabric, fabric, I would say, uh, that our communities of color and our American Indian communities are scared of seeking help. Uh, 
our women, like our women from these communities who are struggling with addiction, are increasingly getting susceptible of losing their children to system. So that is one big reason that a lot of our uh, women really are nervous about coming forward and to say, I need help. Very much like it's a heart disease, it's high blood pressure, it's depression. But inside, the system has discouraged and scared and having this punitive approach for somebody with addiction uh, is sending the message that, you know what, if you seek help, there's a very high chance that you might lose your children uh, or you will be stigmatized. And as Christy mentioned that, you know what, you might be kicked out of your home or it will be really hard for you to rent a house. Um, so we have like the systemic racism in every, every part of our social fabric. So I'm going to go back to Christy. And Christy, if you can just kind of have our listeners um, understand like how you seek stakeholder engagement in bringing these issues of systemic racism to our legislators, because they are the ones <laughs> who really need to hear and you work closely with them. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in having our listeners um, understand your journey with that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I'm, to be honest, it's very challenging to work with some legislators and to really raise these issues because um, depending on kind of where you land on the political spectrum, they can be very controversial. Um, at the Department of Human Services, we are working to become an anti-racist organization. Um, and I was just right before this in a meeting with legislators where I had to um, respond to some concerns and really had to kind of own the fact that yes, we're working to be anti-racist, but we have a long ways to go and we have a lot more that we can do. And that, I, that is a passion of mine is really to bring that voice into, um, into the space where oftentimes people are, are invisible or just completely missing or not listened to. Um, so one of the things that I, at my, when we used to work in the office, I have a picture at my desk of um, an event that we used to have a summer picnic that we had with um, with women and the children that we worked with at my job at, at the previous place um, that I had mentioned. And I keep it at my desk so that I can be reminded when I'm having a hard day and when things are, when these conversations get really difficult and dicey and I feel scared to have to get up there and testify and say something that might, um, you know, offend a legislator because I, you know, say, well, you know, that's actually kind of a racist policy. Um, I have that picture to remind me of where I came from and why I'm here to really change the system and elevate the voices um, in those communities that aren't heard at the legislature. So a few things I would say in, um, as it relates to substance use disorder that um, I think are helpful to know is um, one of the things we did last session, um, and Nirja was really instrumental in this, is we advocated for a community of practice for substance use disorder. And at the center of this community, I mean, typically at a community of practice, there's, um, you know, a lot of professionals, so treatment providers and academics and such. Um, but we really wanted this community of practice to have people who use services or have used services and family members who um, have experience with addiction to really be at the center of that conversation. Um, because we don't hear their voice often enough. And we don't, we, we can't, when we don't have their voice in this circle, we can't um, adapt our policies to make sure that we're being inclusive of what they need um, and how, how we can best support them as a community. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're really looking forward to getting some um, more stakeholder engagement, especially from communities of color. Um, another thing that we're doing kind of broadly at the department and we're working on from a legislative perspective is um, thinking about um, how we actually have dialogue with community and instead of thinking about like, let's just have a listening session, we're really trying to turn that around and, and, and be um, more proactive in soliciting from communities, you know, what is it that you wanna hear from us? What information do you need? What are the conversations that you wanna have? Um, so it's a two-way street and it's not just the department saying, that we're gonna do a new policy and we're gonna do a webinar on it and then you have to just follow it and hopefully you get it. No, it's, it's more interactive, it's more dynamic. Um, that's what a real relationship is with community. So we're um, actively soliciting, soliciting information for what we're calling community empowerment sessions. Um, and we're talking with communities and really having organic conversations similar to this one about what is it they need from us? What aren't we doing right? How can we, how can we make sure that we don't just have you know, a conversation once or hear about an issue once, but how can we make sure we loop back 
um, with them and say, you know, I heard what you said, and as a result, we're going to try to um, we're going to try to put something in the governor's bill this session that addresses um, what the need is that you're identifying. And I personally am always hungry for ideas, <laughs> good ideas to to move forward um, in the administration. So I I'm really excited about that work. Um, and then I would just say I I think you know. Unfortunately, we just we really have a lack of, of um, BIPOC voices at the legislature, and it would be great um, to get more of, of those voices in the mix. Um, and um, certainly, we'd be willing to facilitate any of that if there's listeners out there who are interested. Um, hopefully, Nirja, you can get Nirja and my contact information, and we'd love to help integrate you into that process, which can be somewhat scary, but um, we will try to hold your hand through it as best as we can and encourage you to make your voice heard. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, Christy. And I just want to kind of assure that we kind of, I personally could not have asked for a better partner in this work than Christy. So um, I, we will make sure to share our contact information with Ken and uh, his team. So uh, if our listeners have like ideas or even like you want to be part of the process or you just want to learn how this works, please contact us. Uh, we would love to like chat and um, get your voices like up uh, where they are supposed to be. Um, and as Christy mentioned, like kind of, you know what, it, we have to look at everything we do in the world of addiction care through the social justice lens. We can have the best policy, best possible treatment um, in Minnesota. We can have the best possible providers, well-trained, everything, because we know treatment works. We really know treatment works. There are like, there is tons of data all around the world. World Health Organization is telling us, uh, United Nations is telling us, SAMHSA is telling us, treatment does work. We know that. What is lacking is our courage and our ability to feel uncomfortable in looking at that treatment through the social justice lens. Yes, it does work, but one size does not fit everyone. What works for me is not going to be working for Christy. We are two very different individuals. And that's the direction we want Minnesota to go. Individualized care, culturally responsive care, trauma-informed care. Because you know, Christy talked about this uh, intergenerational trauma that our BIPOC communities and our American Indian communities are facing. So bringing all that together, and then also saying that we are fully committed to integrated healthcare. So if I go to the doctor for my physical checkup, I should be able to get help for my addiction and for my mental, mental health. I should not have to repeat shaming. Uh, information that I'm so scared to share because I don't know how I will be treated within the system. I should be able to connect at a hub, and that's what Minnesota is trying, and I will be talking in a minute about it. That's what Minnesota is really trying. We want one gate for all levels of care. It's like utopian, but we are making like really a um, lot of progress in that direction, which uh, Christy and I will just discuss. Um, but the basic premise is we treat integrated healthcare as a basic human right. That's just pointed. It has to be a basic human right. And if we as society start perceiving our integrated healthcare, including access to evidence-based, culturally responsive uh, addiction treatment as a basic human right, we will be able to address the stigma. We will be able to address a lot of the barriers that our uh, people are facing uh, in, in this area. So we know disparities exist. We know that our society is currently torn. We are really hurt by the just this, these racism experiences, economic inequity, uh, pandemic really kind of showed us how divided we are in terms of access to quality services. Um, so as a public servant, this is the stuff that Christy, it, it bothers us. And we really want to make sure that we are addressing it and we are addressing inherent elements of racism, as Christy touched in her um, talk, in all our policies, all our processes. 
we have to and like not that like you know what we have racist people around us who are like making these policies day and night a lot of that is like inherent bias which is unconscious we don't even know that we are like acting in a certain way that we are really propagating that inherent racist bias in our to our policies so it is very important for us to challenge it's very important for us to have a social justice framework to be like reviewing all our policies how are we having people access um services so christy besides like kind of i know you mentioned community of practice which is going to be a great and we will be reaching out to uh organizations uh who are really working at the ground level to steer us in the right direction um we will not be doing it just sitting in our offices and planning as like a listening session it will be like a real engagement uh have you seen any success stories when you saw that yeah you know what this approach did work and people were able to get better uh with their addiction uh, issues like can you share any success stories with our listeners uh, in your career in dhs or anywhere um which was like very fulfilling and satisfying yeah it's certainly possible and i think with the right treatment and and the right support in place people um people can get well and like nirsh had mentioned addiction is you know a chronic thing so i have asthma and it's not always going to be under control sometimes you know you might have an exacerbation so that does happen and when people have the right support network in place they can get back on track easily well maybe not easily but they can get back on track um i'm sure it's i'm sure it's still a, a significant struggle for many but i have experienced um absolute success stories they are the those stories that drive you to continue to you know want to serve people want to be a public servant want to continue to improve the system um no matter how broken it feels like it is at sometimes um so i i i don't know i've i've had a few um that i can think of but i think One of my favorite stories was um a woman who did um a struggle with opiate use disorders um and she was living in the, a transitional housing program and she doing really well but um still um so struggling with a few kind of um not not opiate use disorder but um some other substance use on the side and so we we worked through that and she actually got to a point where she was using medication assisted treatment And so that was a really great um great choice for her. She was using methadone. Um and she got to a point where she was ready to even get off methadone, which is a really hard thing to do. And so she decided she was going to get off of methadone and she was going to transition to um, a different medication, Suboxone, which is a little bit um a, a little bit different than methadone. Um and and that and it's not an easy transition and she was able to actually um by that point she had moved into her own apartment she was doing very well um she was working on getting her kids back she had a job um and she was able to transition off of methadone onto suboxone and then in a, in a few years she actually got off suboxone altogether which these are, and this is a pretty rare experience because many people are on those medications for a little bit longer but um it was just an incredible success story and i think a lot of that had to do with the fact that she got treatment early um she had a support system she had supportive housing she had people that she you know trusted that she felt safe to to talk to and say oh i had a relapse so that instead of you know being a shameful thing we could be like you know what do we need to do to get you back on track with relapse prevention help how, how can we make sure that whatever it is we do you're also able to maintain your employment because that's a really important thing to you and your success as well um and so um at the end of all of that she ended up um getting custody back of of one of her children that she hadn't had custody of for years she had a transfer of legal custody and it was so exciting to see her go through the process and get custody back and just really heartwarming because it's not an easy thing to do and it it does take a lot of courage um and then at the end of all of that she um decided she wanted to become a licensed alcohol and drug counselor and who better to be you know providing those services and someone who has had those you know very personal experiences with the system and with substance use disorder itself so um she pursued her education and um it was just an amazing story so i was um happy to witness happy to witness that and just really honored to be to be able to observe her success 
thank you. Thank you very much. And that is really that keeps us going, these successes. And it's not like these successes come easy. The way Christy defined was like, it seems like all good. But yeah, there were obstacles. There were failures. But what she had and what we want people in Minnesota to have is a support system around them that they don't give up. Because a lot of times when you are struggling with addiction, there are times when you just give up. And we really do not want our uh, our people to feel that there is no support. So one thing that Minnesota is really working hard to get uh, more uh, support is to kind of have a service which is called Recovery Peers. Um, and these are the professionals who have real life experiences who are themselves uh, in the journey on their recovery and they want to help uh, people who are uh, getting into the treatment and need help. So what Minnesota does it like we have grant programs and also uh, this is a service which is covered in our Medicaid benefit uh, for people who meet the criteria. So that is something we really um, are proud of. There are long ways to go because of the workforce shortage. We don't have many peers. Uh, but we really want to just kind of refine and um, support our people to get this service. Um, another big project that is coming to Minnesota and we are really excited about is, is like it's called R3 project. We will have federal support, as Christy mentioned, like a lot of times, uh, women who are in this um, journey on addiction, uh, having the motivation to either be reunified with their children or... Um, just kind of not to lose their children to the system. That's a huge motivation and we have to support them. So we are bringing a federal project that is going to be again, creating support systems around these women. Um, and we are gonna test the model for next two years and see if there are successes. Um, but, but these projects will create support systems around these women. And we will make sure that these support systems are culturally responsive. We want to make sure that these support systems are not uh, just on paper and then, you know what, someone who our clients, our women are not even comfortable reaching out when they are experiencing distress. Uh, so that's what we are going to do. Um, Minnesota really did, uh, we, we did have like hallmark changes when we uh, went to the concept of direct access. That was like one way, and I'm going to have, Christy really, and she's not going to take the credit, but there was a lot of work Christy and her team did to get us where we are on direct access. We want people in Minnesota to be able to go to the provider of their choice. Very much like if I have a physical health condition, I can go to the doctor I want to. If, yeah, it's the doctors in my insurance network. It does not have to be that I have to go to my county and then my county decides. So I have to wait for like 15 days to get an appointment at my county. Then I go and talk to my county. Then another three months to get an appointment. No, I should be able to pick up the phone like for any other health condition and get into uh, my provider's office for that service. It was an uphill battle everywhere. And our legislative team again, like, fought that bot battle for people of Minnesota. So I'm just going to kind of have Christy just comment a little bit on that. I know she will not take credit and that's fine. Uh, but just kind of how that was rewarding and um, were there any specific strategies you used, Christy, to get it like decades of system where our people who were struggling with addiction had to go jump through all these loopholes to get to treatment? Uh, I certainly will not take credit for that at all, but um, I, you know, thinking about the direct access reform, it really, like Nir just said, it really is a historic reform for the state. Um, and I, I think we still, you know, whenever you make a big change like that, there's always going to be some bumps in implementation, but we are, I think one of the strategies is just making sure that we've had, um, you know, policy staff are working with our provider communities, working with our counties, working with our tribal nations to make sure that they understand how the change is actually going to impact them and, and how they will, um, you know, how they can continue to support people. Because just because we're taking, you know, that kind of middle person step where the person had to go to the county or the tribe to first get an assessment and then go jump through all these hoops, just because we're taking that away doesn't mean that they don't serve a really important role. 
So I think another strategy too is, is you know, just working with counties, we have a lot of stakeholder meetings that we engage in on a regular basis and making sure that they understand that, that, that we aren't saying they're doing something wrong. We're just all trying collectively to help people get better access to treatment. And counties do still, and tribal nations do still play an important role because people will just out of habit um, people that maybe have been in the system for, for a while and, and they've kind of been through the ringer. Many people do many treatments before the, it actually kind of is the final treatment, for, at least for, for a while. Um, so they're used to going to their county. So counties will still play an important role, making sure people know, you know, you can go to any doctor now, any doctor that treats substance use disorder, you can make an appointment and go get an assessment. You don't have to jump through, through our hoops anymore. Um, and so I think just really having open communication with, um, with the counties and the tribes and everyone that's really impacted. Um, trying to think if there's any other strategies that I would, I would highlight. I mean, I think, I think just open communication is the biggest one. Um, the other thing I would say is that we did get some help from the federal government in, in some ways. Um, so part of the reason that we have to make this transition is because we have a special um, special kind of allowance through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that actually allows us to restrict the choice of providers. So this isn't really a good thing in most senses. Sometimes we have to get that allowance for certain services, but our ability to, to be able to do that will be expiring this July. So we won't be in accordance with, with um, basically federal requirements to get a, a Medicaid a funding match to pay for treatment for people. Um, so certainly that's, um, I don't know if it's a strategy, but it's an important consideration that really it's not even, it's bigger than just Minnesota. It's, it's the entire country is sort of moving to this model of, um, and CMS has for years been saying people need to have um, access to the provider of their choice. And that that's something that actually improves access to treatment and increases and improves outcomes. Thank you, Christy. And uh, what Christy just said, that takes to like kind of to the next big thing that is happening in Minnesota is like, it's called 1115 demonstration. That is again, like our federal partners um, want Minnesota, they have allowed Minnesota and we applied and we got selected. So now we have to make sure that everything we do in Minnesota on the name of treatment is evidence-based. It is based on the individual needs and it is like that whole one size fit all approach no longer exists. Like I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but that's our goal that it should not exist. And as part of the federal demonstration project, that's what Minnesota uh, will be moving towards. And it's like kind of a heavy lift and we have great team, but we will need community. We will need you all at every step to make sure that uh, we are doing the right thing here. Um, the last thing I want to mention before I hand it over to um, our friends um, is like the whole concept of medication assisted treatment. Christy did allude to it when she was talking about uh, the American Indian women she uh, used to work with. We know that medication assisted treatment does work. There is every evidence that it does work in combination with therapy, in combination with counseling, Medication-assisted treatment really aids in people's recovery and their health. Federal government wants us to make sure that Minnesota, like rest of the states, we are offering medication-assisted treatment to our clients here. Now, given the stigma associated with addiction and now on top of it, they are like, well, we don't, uh, it's just a difference of philosophies. And that's like an ongoing dialogue that is going on in Minnesota um, regarding how to make sure that our people have access to best possible evidence-based culturally responsive treatment, uh, irrespective of the fact that, you know what, I as a provider don't believe in it. I want to make sure that my clients have access to the best possible treatment. If I can't provide it, I should be able to make sure to kind of connect them with someone who can. Um, so, uh, Christy, do you have any thoughts on medication assisted treatment before I go to the last? I do actually. So, um, yeah, I think medication assisted treatment has, you know, it's, it's a little, little bit controversial for people who maybe take the approach of like an abstinence only model where it's like, 
they view, um, you know, using those medications as actual like chemical use or substance use, which is not the view of mainstream um, medicine or certainly of, of DHS. Um, as part of our, um, Nirja mentioned our 1115 demonstration, which is just like fancy ways for, we have special authorities through the through the federal government to, um, to require things in our treatment settings and then to get certain kinds of funding for it. Um, and so with, with that one, I mean, the biggest thing is evidence-based um, that providers will have to, you know, comply with evidence-based practices and the, um, the standards set forth in the American Society of Addiction Medicine requirements. Um, and part of that is related to medication-assisted treatment. And so DHS put out a policy on how medication-assisted treatment requirements would be applied to providers. And we um, actually got a fair amount of pushback um, from, from, you know, louder providers. Um, saying that they would didn't want they didn't agree with our policy they didn't want to be, have to offer that to people so we did have to um, amend our policy in the end in conversations with the legislature but we did also put out I think Nirja and her team put out this amazing um, policy statement about medication assisted treatment and how it impacts BIPOC communities and so one of the things we had to make really clear with the legislature and they and they were actually receptive. Um, some of them I was surprised in a smaller meeting was that when we say we're going to restrict people from going to, you know, from treatment programs, from having to accept people on um, methadone or suboxone or other medication assisted treatments, um, that is really one of those examples that Nirja mentioned where we have to look at then our policies and how they exacerbate disparities because we know that African Americans and communities of color use those medication assisted treatments at higher rates. And so therefore would be disproportionately impacted by a policy that would say, you know, you, you can't go to treatment here. So it's still a struggle. It's still um, something that we have to advocate for all the time at the legislature. Thank you so much. Um, but I think that, yes, it, it is still a struggle and we will continue to do the work. Um, and then I'm going to kind of um, ask Ken um, if he has um, any questions for Christy and I. Let me get back in here. Um, most people who are watching this through the church know that I'm a physician. So um, this is something, and I work at HCMC. So this is something that impacts me on a regular basis. Um, one of the things that you touched on, and, and this is a goal of our social justice forums, how can we as a church uh, or as individuals, or both for that matter, be a part of moving forward um, lots of different pieces of this. One is we all know there's an opioid epidemic, so anything we can do there, but also you're raising for us policy issues which impact access, the way care is delivered. So anyway, speak to how individuals might be able to aid in this whole journey or the church as a whole. Well, I'm going to have Christy go first. This is like a very important question for both of us. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Ken. So I think, um, I mean, I think the first thing is maybe getting connected in with the Department of Human Services social media, if people are comfortable with social media. Um, and then there's also different ways where you can get kind of updates from us uh, via email. And so that's something that we can potentially help help you and your um, and your members get connected with, because that kind of sets you up and gives you the foundation to just have information at minimum and understand what's going on. Um, there are certain provider associations um, for substance use disorder um, that advocate at the Capitol, and they also probably put out, have regular meetings and put out publications that would be helpful for you to know. Um, things like emails on like call to action, go and advocate on a certain day on a certain issue. Um, so that those are things that I think are kind of the, the basics that we could start you out with. Um, and then I just think in general, if, if you all have questions um, about kind of, you know, once maybe the, the governor puts out his, his budget, his supplemental budget, um, or you hear that things are going on at the legislature, we're always a resource at DHS too. We, um, at least me, I love when people get excited about advocacy and being involved in the legislative process, um, because like I said, we just, we need so much more of it. So I'm also a, a good resource 
um, to reach out to if, if people have questions. And I do my best to respond even during session when things get kind of wild. Thank you, Christy. Um, that is that is awesome. And then again, I just want to add, uh, you know, hold us accountable as a community. Please hold us accountable. Like ask ask us. Well, you guys said you'll do this. Where is what's the status? And all this like great all these great projects you are talking about, or like you know when legislative session comes, we submit our reports and so just hold us accountable to the outcomes that we say we will achieve. Either we'll kind of let you know that, oh, we could not, and this is what we need, or we will let you know, you know, we did. So it's like an ongoing collaboration and ongoing communication between organizations like yours. Uh, and then just raising this awareness and addressing stigma around uh, addiction. I think you guys are way better positioned than us to really address stigma. Uh, around seeking care for uh, addiction. So that's what we want. The last thing I would say, sorry to interject quick, but I was just thinking, you know, health, health in general, including substance use disorder and, and mental health. I mean, that's so much of it um, is addicted by environment too. And so when you hear about other issues that might seem tangential, like housing is a really big one, for example, um, those are really important issues to advocate on behalf of too. So if you're connected into networks that are, um, you know, advocating on kind of um, other social determinants of health, I think that that's a really um, great way to get involved as well and to help support the cause. Bill, did you have a question? Uh, well, I, I did actually have one, and then one of the one of our uh, team members that's um, listening in as well had a, a related question, so I'll try to tie the two together. And that is, um, uh, Michelle's question was, is there a movement toward medical care honed for medical assisted treatment, uh, community-based where people's, people live? And I, related to that, I'm thinking of some of the communities that um, um, I know I was reading about recently, like the Somali East African community um, in Minneapolis and the Generation Hope Project and, uh, and others. So maybe you could start by some comments in that regard. I'll start and then I'll have Christy um, jump in. Uh, we are working on currently like our opioid treatment programs. We are working with them uh, to ensure that access to medication assisted treatment is equitable as well as like kind of, uh, there is a combination of therapy the counseling element along with medication assisted treatment. So we, there are 16 OTP providers right now in Minnesota. Uh, as well as like medical care home, I am not aware um, if there is any specific uh, moment uh, around that, but Christy, do you know um, anything around it? Um, I'm sorry, but I, so was that the, um... The question about different like pain management and different kinds of modes of therapy no it's like medical care homed for um, uh, medication assisted treatment which is like community based so where people are living uh, we do provide transportation we support like kind of when people have to go and get their dosing uh, but i'm not aware of anything specific no i'm not either i mean i think um i think kind of what i mentioned around our medication assisted treatment policy is applicable primarily to substance use disorder treatment providers, so not, you know, um, housing providers and, and such. So I, I'm not aware of anything in that space either, but we can always get back to you with more information. Sure. And you this know, is Ken. Go ahead, Ken. Um, and Phil, you're watching the time better than I, so help out with when we need to transition. I can actually make a little comment about that. Um, you've emphasized that this is a medical disease and, and thank goodness the providers and the medical community that I hang out with really have transitioned to see it that way. Um, and one of the most wonderful things that came along was a medicine that you mentioned, not in passing, but it went by quickly called Suboxone. Most people are aware that methadone has been used for years as to help people who have, were addicted, they can go on methadone and it keeps them from having the profound withdrawals and it's maintenance, but it, and it's forever in a sense. But you had to go to a methadone clinic that was licensed and it was the only place you could get methadone. 
Suboxone can be prescribed by any one of us as providers if we go through the eight hour training, which actually now isn't even eight hours. Um, and that means that a person can see me or one of my partners at HCMC for their cold, for their heart problem, and for their addiction problem. And I just think that is a radical, wonderful change. And the addiction folks tell me they've actually got seven different drugs in their armamentarium that they pull out at different times for different people for different needs. So it's changing. Yep, absolutely. And we, we are continuing to work on that. And we really want to make sure our providers are supported to use any kind of we do not want to come in, in between provider and the client. We want to support you in deciding in collaboration with your client what is the best. So which medication would work for your client? And uh, again, we want to make sure our communities of color have access to Suboxone, very much like they have access to methadone because there is like a clear uh, bias there too. Um, so, um, and there is going to be state funding to educate providers on ad unconscious. I know uh, Michelle's question is there on unconscious systemic bias. We are going to be rolling out uh, statewide training and resources to implement class standards in all aspects of our service delivery system. Uh, class is like culturally, linguistic, language, cu culturally, language, linguistically, whatever, but it's like, uh, appropriate service standards, which are taking into account a uh, person's culture and their linguistic needs. Um, so we will be implementing, and those are federal class standards. There are 16 standards um, that Minnesota will be striving to, to put in place. Phil, um, how are we doing for time? I have another well, question, we, we but- could, I think we maybe have time for one more question before we need to wrap up here. And I know that you've talked about a lot of different concerns. And I, you know, I would like each of you maybe just to briefly recap for us, what do you see as the key policy and legislative priorities that we really need to be watching? I think the priorities, I'll just going to start, and I don't know Christy will have a list. Uh, but for me, it's going to be like, how is Minnesota implementing its commitment to make sure people are getting the care with no obstacles? So the whole concept of direct access, we want to make sure it is operationalized to the optimum. The second thing we want to make sure is the care which is provided in the world of addiction is very much evidence-based. And it follows the criteria set by ASM, uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine. Um, as far as access to medication assisted treatment is concerned, we are making a lot of efforts. There is going to be a legislative report coming out, uh, mentioning what Ken just mentioned about the different models of access to medication assisted treatment uh, and how we can support our primary care providers to uh, really help uh, in dealing with that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to Christy. What are your priorities? I've been thinking a lot about this because I get a lot of, you know, a, a lot of push on this. We should do this. We should do that. And it's like, how do, how do you center what everyone is asking you to do? And then really what is best for people? Because that's the voice that we're, you know, trying to raise and, and trying to elevate as um, working for the state. And so I think right now, just in general, the biggest, um, I'm really focused on it in the upcoming session and in sessions to come, improving quality, improving access to care, um, and making sure that we have better outcomes because things are not getting better in our communities. Um, we see the opiate crisis getting worse. We see overdose deaths going you know, up. Um, and so we really need to focus on quality um, and, and improving access. I know that sometimes that conflicts with a desire to sometimes, you know, roll back regulations or um, sometimes increase rates or things like that. But those two things don't have to, I think those those initiatives can exist together, but we do have to make a commitment to really focus on the person and how the person is experiencing treatment and what's working for them um, and really adjusting the system accordingly and bringing our providers along with us. Well, thank you both. I, we really appreciate both of you and the work of your teams in sharing your experience and perspectives. And, you know, this is really timely. You mentioned, I think it was, Christy, of healthcare being a basic human right. And we want to remind our audience that 
December 10th is International Human Rights Day. <laughs> Very timely discussion. So uh, we wanna really thank you for your contributions. And um, again, remind um, our listeners that the social justice forums will be on pause during the Christmas holiday, but we will resume January 9. So watch the church announcements um, for those forums. We're working on several topics right now. And uh, we really look forward to um, uh, picking up these discussions. Thanks again to everyone. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thank you.